for the last two years, and so you'll understand why that's important in a minute. Um, so I just want to orient you to the folders that you have in front of you. And so I unashamedly put my business card on the front, <laughs> and you will see the three organizations that I follow and support on the back of the business card. And then inside, there are a couple of separate pieces of paper. One is a color sheet, you've either got orange or yellow, and that is for a game that we're gonna play later. And there is a prize. The second sheet is mental health first aid, and we're actually gonna be talking today about mental health first aid, and what does that mean, and um, what's that all about. So that's something for you to take away. And then this packet actually was kindly put together by NAMI of Greater Orlando. And they are an organization who help with people with mental illness. And so NAMI actually deals with people once they have a mental illness. There are other organizations that deal with um, people before they actually get to stage four. And that's called Mental Health America. Um, but with NAMI of Greater Orlando, I am actually being trained as a peer-to-peer -peer specialist. So I will be able to train people who are living with a mental condition. And I'm also being trained, and I'm speaking next week, as a in our own voice. So it's where people with lived experiences, I actually didn't know what that was until last year. So it's for people with lived experiences who um, just share the story of hope and recovery. Okay, so we're ready for this, right? Yeah. And again, unashamedly, Brago Photo is my son-in-law. He is a professional photographer. So my goal is to use all his photography and all my materials. I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> and so what I want us to do to start off with, because you probably could do with this, right now, is I want you to close your eyes. I want you to take a deep breath in. And when I say a deep breath in, it's from your stomach. You're gonna to count to four. One, two, three, four. And then breathe it out. One, two, three, four. Deep breath in. One, two, three, four. Deep breath out. Okay, open your eyes. That, is a, that technique is actually called box breathing, and it's a technique that is used by the Navy SEALs when they are in situations where they need to just like come together. So, you know, in the fire business, it might be something that you, as you're going into situations, you might think, I just need to pull myself together and just do some box breathing. So, a technique for you to take away. So, what I'd like to do is share a little bit about my journey. And I actually worked in corporate America for 30 years. This year, I just stepped out of corporate America. So you'll see that episode one, which obviously suggests there was more than one episode. Episode one, I attempted suicide in August of 2014. So I had a number of triggers that led up to my suicide attempt and I lost my dog, I lost my mom, I thought I needed to be doing a different job, I was totally stressed out. I called my boss at six o'clock in the morning and said, I can't do this anymore, I'm going to quit. And he said to me, what are you talking about? Are you going to quit? Like, I was like, yeah, I've got to do this piece of work. And he's like, Elaine, you that piece of work that you've got to do is something that we give like new hires, associates to do. I was like, I know, I just can't do it. And I was in the hotel room and I'm pulling out my hair and just going, I can't do this anymore. I was living in Charlotte, North Carolina at the time. So he said, you know what? This is not like you. You just go and take some time. So I was like, okay, I'll go and take some time. So taking time actually led into being off work for almost five months. Taking time meant that I went into total isolation 
I only allowed my husband and a friend in. I lost about 30 pounds, all my clothes were hanging off me. I didn't want to go out. I didn't want to go and see a doctor. I didn't want to go and see a psychologist. I didn't want to go and see a psychiatrist because I'm a Christian and Christians don't do that, right? And I don't want to take medication. Um, so what happened was I finally went to see my doctor. I went to see a psychologist. I went to see a psychiatrist. Um, and one day while my husband was out at soccer, I got my pills. I wrote a letter and I was literally like, I can't believe that this is what this has come to. I really can't believe I'm going, I'm like, Lord, I'm crying. I can't believe I'm actually going to take my own life. I Googled, do Christians actually go to hell if they commit suicide? And I'm using commit suicide um, at this point, but that's the wrong language to use. And obviously Google told me yes and no. So I was like, I'm going to hell anyway, so I might as well talk myself. So I found a seat and I sat there and I had my pills and I put them to my mouth and my husband texted me and said, I'm on my way home. I was like, oh, what am I doing? Threw the pills away, hid my note. My husband comes home, I'm like, hey love, how are you? We go to our neighbors for dinner. I'm at dinner thinking this is my last supper. The next morning I woke up and I said to my husband, this is what I tried to do yesterday, but I'm gonna do it now. So I ran down the stairs and he was like, called my best friend, called my psychiatrist, and I'm like trying to get into the doors to take knives to kill myself. So I went to an ER, and obviously you go and see somebody in ER based on your level of trauma and based on like priority. So I went into the ER, as soon as I got in there, I was seeing a nurse, a doctor. Um, I got taken, all my clothes, stripped naked, and then scrubs put on me, in case I did anything with the clothes that I was wearing. And then this doctor was telling me that I needed to go into a hospital. And I was like, don't know. And he's like, this is a new hospital. It's like a resort, it's like a hotel. And I'm just like, do you think I'm stupid? <laughs> no, I'm not going. Um, and so basically I went to the hospital, which was actually a psychiatric unit. So I was in the psychiatric unit for 10 days. I call being in the psychiatric unit actually being in a resort, because it was really nice. <laughs> but you had to like line up and go to to go to breakfast, lunch, and dinner. There was like police officers there. It was pretty strict. So I was in the psychiatric unit for 10 days. Then I got released and I was in outpatient for three weeks. Um, and then I went on a cruise. And what I didn't know at the time was that medication actually takes six to eight weeks to kick in. So, you know, it's not like taking ibuprofen and you like get really headache. So my medication kicked in and this light came on and I was like, oh, I can go back to work. Went back to work, went really back with, so I'm talking about me, so I don't know where you stand in your faith, but God had told me like mental health advocacy. And I was like, no, I'm not having the mental health label, no. And then so I was like, okay, I'll, I'll have the mental health label. But I'll continue doing what I'm doing. I work for PricewaterhouseCoopers, like one of the top consulting firms in the world. I'm a management consultant, going to all these clients, really performing, performing, but really trying to like be the best that I could be. During that time, we came to Florida because my husband was a soccer coach for Orlando City Youth, and we came to Central Florida. So what happened last year? I took an overdose. So 2020 was a bit of an unusual year, right? <laughs> For most people. Um, the beginning of the year, I was working on a client site actually just in South Florida. And it was a really stressful project. And I got to the point where I was like, I can't do this anymore. And I was overwhelmed and I was over committing and I wasn't setting boundaries and I wasn't saying no. My dog died. I hope my current dog doesn't die too soon because I just kind of like this common theme, dog dies, I do something. 
So my dog dies, sell my house. I had this amazing home on the lake, huge, it was great. Sold everything, got rid of all my stuff. We end up in an apartment and then we end up in a rental home. The rental home, I was only in there for about a month before I took my overdose. I took my overdose in September. I, again, I isolated. I couldn't get out of bed. I had really great friends like Laurel and another girlfriend who were contacting me daily and Laurel would say, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm in bed. I like, I can't get up. She's like, we're going for lunch. I'm like, okay. I'm like literally five minutes before she called in the driveway, I get out of bed. So something happened, I saw a bill. I was just like, I can't do this anymore. I'm just gonna take my pills. So this time I actually took the pills. I ingested a, an entire bottle of um, antidepressants. As soon as I took them, I texted my husband and said, I just took all my pills, but I'm okay, don't worry, you don't have to worry about me. And I contacted my friend who's a doctor. Don't worry about me, but I've just taken all my pills. And Laurel calls me. What have you done? What have you done? I'm calling the ER. I'm like, I'm okay, I'm fine. I just took all my pills, it's fine. <laughs> so I go to the ER, I'm in the ER for three days. Then I go to a facility, a residential facility this time, for two and a half months, and I come out. And then we're in January of this year, I get released, and I'm trying to like figure out what am I gonna do with my life? I was like, oh my goodness. And God tells me, mental health <laughs> advocacy. I was just like, no. Um, and it was only in April of this year that I fully committed to do mental wellness advocacy. I thought, you know what, I don't, I'm not living in shame. There's so much stigma around it. I wanna be able to end the stigma. I want people to be able to say, I'm a suicide survivor, as much as they can say I'm a recovering alcoholic. So here I am today, <laughs> sharing my story with you. <laughs> um, um, so what did I actually learn through all this? So I learned that people attempt suicide not because they want to die, it's because I didn't have a reason to live. I didn't know how to live anymore. I was just like so stuck. Support systems are super important, whether it's one person or two. So Laurel is my support person, thank you. Um, listen to the professionals. Remember I didn't want to speak to the professionals? But you know, professionals are here. You're here, you're professionals. You're here for a reason, right? You wanna save lives, I wanna save lives. We've both got the same mission. Medication takes six to eight weeks to kick in. I already told you that. So many, my doctors didn't actually tell me that. I was like really surprised. I thought it's like, you know, take ibuprofen, get rid of your headache in four hours. I'll be okay in four hours. Self-care is really important and we're going to talk a little bit more about self-care in a moment. And for me, what was important, what I learned is God never leaves me nor forsakes me, even if I don't listen. And he's always there, even if I don't think he is. So that's my journey. This, that's what takes me here today to share with each of you, because we're all on the same mission to save lives. So this is me in March of this year. So I thought I'd broken my arm. Now, did I actually sit there and pray and ask for my arm to be healed? No, I immediately went to the ER. And so, you know, I wrote a book, it's my banner, <laughs> My Crazy Summer, which is about my first attempt. And it was really about the conflict between medication and faith, because there were so many people in the faith who would tell me, your faith is not strong enough, you need to pray more. And it really wasn't that, it was because I had a chemical imbalance, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's why doctors are on this earth. So, yeah, we need to trust people. So is it health, is it wellness versus illness? So we talked about self-care and the whole body. Well, here is a fundamental difference between mental health and mental illness. We all have mental health, we all have physical health. Some of us may have a physical illness, some of us may have a mental illness. At the end of the day, some of us may not have a mental illness, but we all have mental health. So whole person, 
wellness, you'll see that there are eight dimensions. So it's not just the mind and the body. There are eight factors that come into consideration as you think about the overall whole person. Um, I mean, I can talk for hours on each one of these specific points, so for the purpose of time is just to show you these. But there are a couple that I really want to call out. So the first is physical. So you'll see that there are a number of sub-dimensions under physical. Nutrition is really important. So something that I've just recently learned that I didn't know is that most of us think that our all our serotonins are in our brain. They're actually not, they're in your gut. Like 90% of your serotonin is in your gut. So you are what you eat. <laughs> so it's really important to eat healthy because that actually affects your brain. Um, sleep, it's really important to have sleep, sleep and healthy sleep. Um, like eight hours sleep and good sleep. Um, if you're going to be able to work at your at your best and social like social is really important like and that's I think part of the problem last year was that we were isolated and we didn't have the opportunity to be social um, so I think this is really important to all these factors and it's because like the last time that I looked at me my whole body my head and my body are still connected and it's really interesting that, you know, we can talk about anything from here downwards, but as soon as you go from here upwards, people don't want to talk about it. And yet people are happy to say that they have like diabetes, but they wouldn't tell you if they were on any mental medication. I just find it fascinating. So again, my mission is to stop the stigma, at least reduce it for one person. So what's wrong? So here's a little quiz for you. So you can take time, talk to the person next to you and try and fill in the gaps. So the first one, 50% of all lifetime mental illness begins at what age? So you'll see there are question marks. So just spend like five minutes or so talking to the person next to you and let's see if you come up with the answers.
So 75% is by what age? 24. Yeah. What percentage of people who die by suicide have a diagnosed mental health condition? 6%. 6%? 6%? 46%. Now you see the language in that sentence? Remember earlier I talked about committing suicide? That's the wrong language. So if you take one thing away from today, you never say that somebody commits suicide. You say they died by suicide. Because if you say commit, commit is like a bad thing, right? You commit a crime, you commit a sin. No, they died by suicide or they kill themselves. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for people ages 15 to 25, 24 to 36, 10 to 34. Wow. Yeah. Does that surprise you? I figured it was going to be a smaller gap. Mm -hmm. That was another huge number. It is. Absolutely. in the US? What, what mental illness? What substance abuse? Depression. So there are lots of different mental illnesses and depression is the leading cause of disability. How much does depression and anxiety disorder cost the global economy? A lot of money. <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah, so it's actually one trillion dollars. One trillion is lost in productivity globally. So if you think about yourself or your colleagues, you know, what loses productivity? People not showing up for work. People being in work, but really not being there. That's called presenteeism, where somebody is physically and work, but really they're not, their heads elsewhere. What is the average delay between symptom onset and treatment? Five years. Five years? A year? 10 to 11 years. So if you think about that, it's because of the stigma, right? So remember the earlier slide where I showed you the picture of my arm? Imagine if I waited 10 to 11 years to go and see the doctor to get my arm fixed. They'd have to re-break it, I'd have to go through a lot more pain. So look at the pain and the suffering that somebody is going through because of the stigma associated with mental health. That's current? That is current, wow. yes. Yeah. I know, wow. Because <laughs> people hide it. If you had seen me, Two years ago, this is how I looked. Right. And yeah, I had like my mask on. If you say, how are you? I'm great. Everything's fine. Elaine, do you find men or women worse? The statistics are, I mean, it's different, but not really, yeah. There are different, I mean, you can actually look at the statistics and take them to state level and county level. So here's some more. Another little pop quiz for you because I know Americans love pop quizzes. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in America 21 years. I should have said actually at the beginning of this that if anything that I'm saying triggers something in you, then please like feel free to like get up and leave. I should have made that comment at the beginning.
in the US someone dies by suicide, how often? how many people in the US lose their life to alcohol use disorder? <laughs> 80,000 approximately lose their life to alcohol misuse. So remember earlier when somebody was joking about alcohol and I was like, I don't drink anymore because I had a really bad experience two years ago, and I was just like, ah, no. And you know, I'm not saying that's you, <laughs> because some people can drink, not a problem, and it's okay. Um, but yeah. How many, one in how many Americans have a mental health condition? One in five Americans have a mental health condition. So if you look at how many people are in this room, I'm one of them. <laughs> so, so yeah, so the statistics are like, they want to make me cry sometimes because I think about all these people that are suffering and they're in pain and they feel like they're the only person in the world who is going through this. And I would never want anybody to be in that deepest, darkest place that I was. And that's why I want to be able to make an impact on these figures. And you can help by becoming more aware. So here is what's wrong in fire and EMS. I you note I haven't put any blanks because I just want you to take a moment to look at the statistics. And it's really interesting, I think it would, or it would be interesting to look at Florida and see what the statistics are for Florida. And you can actually get the statistics by state, by county. One of these statistics that I thought was really interesting was the second one. The study from Northern Illinois University that said that the 911 dispatchers actually suffer a lot with PTSD because of like they're the first one really that takes the call to find out like what to do and where to go um, and I can't even imagine being in the fire or the EMS and, and doing that job I mean every person is a hero it's like unbelievable I think the big difference too is as a fire service sometimes we get to see the good result of like when we transfer them to the hospital and they've regained a pulse or they start breathing again We've met with them after they've been released, and the dispatchers never get that closure. True. Yeah. Okay. They're really ignored. They're really ignored. Yeah. We show up, we do whatever it is that we do, transport or not, you know, they save them or not, and we do get to see what all happens. They end up, at, it's like asking a friend on a phone call a question, and then they hang up before you get the answer, and they have no idea. Yeah. So even for getting full, full circle as far as meeting some of the people that we get to see after the fact, that doesn't usually happen. That's a, you know, and they're yeah. not considered heroes. You know, they're, right. they're just really, yeah. and they are, because exactly. they walk people through CPR and everything else, and they calm them down, and they, you know, they, mm -hmm. they get the information, and they get the help on the way. Exactly. But they're not, they're just totally ignored. It's just a group that, that we So if you know dispatchers, and you know yeah. these, this information, like, don't ignore them. Love on them, hug them. 
Like, let them know that you're there for them. Well, I think even, so I'm still on a truck. I know the dispatchers by voice. Mm -hmm. I know them by phone calls, but I don't know them. Mm -hmm. I don't have that, and, and I'm sure it's the same for most of them in here. We don't, you just don't have that necessarily connection with them because they're removed in a building answering phone calls and we're removed in a fire station or an administration building or mm -hmm. out on the road to where we don't, we don't have a daily interaction with them. Not to say that we can't be polite and kind to them, you know, when we do interact with them, but. Um, so I would challenge you then, <clears throat> given that what you just said, which mm -hmm. is like so real, right? It is, it is. So I would challenge you to like, think about what can you do to change that? What can you do to make a difference? Even if it's you go and see them on your day off or whatever, so. Yeah. What we've done with um, our peer support group was we orchestrated the, the, um, the EMS side to, to we, we've taken the, the ladder truck and the bucket and, and, and given them rides and, yes. and stuff and, and just get them to know each other. Mm. And that, that has helped. And we bring therapy dogs mm. all the time. That's you know, cool. And they love it. They absolutely love it. Yeah, yeah. Because they probably do feel like they're ignored, right? Because they're yeah, the they ones do. taking the calls. And they're in a dark room with six screens. Mm -hmm. It's just, mm -hmm. they're like little mushrooms. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They are. They're just little yeah. Yeah. So, also look at that second to last statistic. In 2017, 103 firefighters died by suicide more than the 93 fire survivors who died in the line of duty. Because it's a really stressful job. Because of many reasons. So yeah, I was like horrified when I was looking at the statistics. And obviously the pandemic, like the way that's impacted everything, it's just like multiplied X times. So, are you going to be brave? I'm going to do an exercise. And this exercise, we actually use this at high schools and middle schools. And we train um, high school students to be student ambassadors. So, you know, because a lot of time high schoolers will only speak to another high schooler. So they participate in this, which means that you're going to, right? <laughs> okay, so where do you stand? So this is an exercise. I'm going to read a statement. And if it applies to you, then I would ask you to stand. If it doesn't, stay sitting. There are going to be a number of statements made. So I, you can just remain standing. Okay. I know someone who's gone through or is in a depression. I know someone who's talked about suicide. Stay standing. I know someone who self injures. I've been asked by someone to not tell anyone about their feelings of mental illness or self-harm. I know someone who's using alcohol, marijuana, or other drugs to cope with stress or feelings of depression. So look around. We all know someone who has been in this place. And I don't hesitate to say that maybe one of those people is you. Thank you. You can sit back down. Wow, that was a bit heavy, wasn't it? <laughs> so what do we do about it? Okay, so what do we do about it? So our response is to identify, understand, and respond to the signs of addiction and mental illness. So just like you're trained to do CPR, physical first aid, I am trained as a trainer, as an instructor to do mental health first aid. So mental health first aid, I've just got a few slides explaining what mental health first aid is and it's actually, it was one of the handouts that you have. 
So basically, it's like the initial help that you give somebody who is showing signs and symptoms of either mental health or substance abuse problems. I see some of you looking for the piece of paper, so it's this piece of paper that gives you the summary. So you're basically being like a, a first aider for somebody with mental health issues or substance abuse issues. Like how many of you know CPR? That's good. <laughs> yeah. How, would, how many of you know mental health first aid? Okay. So this is what you learn in the training that you go through. So you learn about the risk, of risk factors and warning signs, you get information about the different types of mental illnesses, you get a five-step action plan, and also the availability of resources. And this is the action plan, it's called Algae. There's a koala bear there because it actually came from Australia, but now uh, mental health first aid is in like 25 countries. And so we actually go through the Algae action plan knowing that it's not linear, it's, it's actually, you can be using different steps depending upon the situation. Work and mental health first aid actually help. So you see, it's like CPR. It's more about early intervention. Obviously in my situation, a mental health first aid wasn't gonna help me. I had to go straight to hospital. So I was in crisis. I needed treatment. And who are we reaching? So this uh, slide shows statistics of 2017, and we've got more than one million, we've actually got more than two million people trained as mental health first aiders, and we have more than 12,000 mental health first aid instructors. And how do you actually, how do we deliver mental health first aid training? We deliver it either in person, in a one day class, we deliver it virtual, so you do two hours of pre-work, and then we come together in a virtual Zoom environment and do the training. Or we do it blended, where you still do pre-work on your own, and then we come and actually train you in person. You'll see on the bottom, there are different types of mental health first aid classes, and the three that I'm showing you are the three that I've been certified to deliver. So it's mental health for adults, the fire and EMS, and public safety, which are like police officers, first responders, etc. And basically those two modules are the same as the adult one, but they give examples and scenarios for the specific service. And I know that some people will say to me, I, I've had this in the, from the fire service and from the police. It's like, well, you, you don't work in our field, so you don't know what it's like. And I'm like, absolutely, I don't know what it's like. And I'm prepared to like go in a fire truck, go on a ride along, go and see what happens in the community of firefighters and of police officers. What I do know is that everybody is a human. And so we all deal with stuff in our way. So what are people saying about the course? Okay, let's see. I think I need to minimize and I need to show the video. I did it for my congregation. For my family. For the women diagnosed with breast cancer that I work with every day. I am a retired marketing manager. Corrections officer. Social worker. I'm a teacher. I'm a realtor. I'm a health coach. I'm in a band. I'm a nurse. Before taking the class, I was unprepared. To help someone that might be experiencing uh, a mental health crisis. Someone struggling with depression. Anxiety. An eating disorder, schizophrenia. Drug or alcohol overuse. A panic attack. 
or a traumatic event, suicidal thoughts, just when you're feeling blue, or someone's just having a bad day. It could be a coworker, a friend, a neighbor, it could be a client, a family member, a stranger, somebody in a coffee shop. It could be anyone. just don't know how. Now I have the knowledge to take action for someone who needs help. I learned signs to look for. I took away basic tools to help someone struggling. And in that helping, you may be saving their life. Sometimes topics are scary or intimidating. I learned to be more confident in asking the tough questions. How to respond in situations. How to better support them. It's just how to listen. Places to go to, to get professional help. It is like CPR for the mind and soul. So I've used it with friends and family. I use it with my church youth ministry. I've used it with my daughter. I use the training every day. Either directly or indirectly every day. Every day. Every day. Learn the signs. Get the tools. Make a difference in someone's life. Depre- what he's like dealing with or she's dealing with depression, marital 
stress, PTSD, suicide. And he actually said, like the, um, Brian said, you know, that instead of using pride there, it could, you could actually have stigma because people don't want to share about mental stuff because why would you? Because nobody talks about from here to here, remember? <clears throat> so I, I just really thought you would appreciate that. So self-care. So I put that slide on there, but I actually also bought one on Amazon because <laughs> I thought sometimes crops are good, right? So, you know, when we go on a plane, which probably we haven't been on for a while, like what are we asked to do? Take care of yourself before helping anybody else. Yeah, absolutely. Because if you don't take care of you, you can't take care of anybody else. And imagine being a firefighter who's not taking care of themselves and then having to go into a really stressful situation to help others. Right? Remember the last slide where they're dealing with all the life stuff? I could imagine how difficult that must be. I have friends who will tell me, Oh my goodness, I'm spending all this time looking after my family and doing blah de blah de blah. And I'm like, I can coach you, I'm a coach. And they're like, no, I haven't got time for that. Okay, don't put your oxygen mask on then. So, <laughs> um, so some fast facts for self-care. On average, people only spend 15 minutes a day on health-related self-care. Go for a walk not being sitting at the desk all day. Just taking time to breathe. Think about your day and how you spend your day. I'm not gonna ask you to stand up, raise your hand or do anything, right? I just want you to think about this. Self-care is proven to reduce stress and anxiety levels while increasing self-compassion. If you can't love yourself first, then you're not gonna love anybody else. If you can't be kind to yourself, you can't be kind to others. I know now, based on my experience, if I'm getting really stressed, I can feel it in my body, and I know I need to move. I know I need to go away. I know I need to go and take a walk, because I'm not healthy myself. I feel like I'm a superwoman. I'm like, oh, mental health advocacy, I wanna do like all this stuff. I wanna go and do podcasts, I wanna do YouTube channels, I wanna do stand on the mountain. And I know I can't do all that at once. I just gotta pace myself, right? So. It's important that you take care of yourself. Of people who took a depression screen at mhascreening.org, in 2020, 73% felt tired or said that they had very little energy at least half of the time or nearly every day. How many of you like feel tired on a regular basis in the day that you've got no energy? And what do we do? Like we, like we tend to just like keep going, right? Like, I can get through this, I've gotta get this done. Rather than like, that's your body telling you, hey, take a break. Even if it's stand up, walk out, come back in, take a break. And then there's the sources of that information. So everything that I show you, I really try to have the evidence that backs it up. So it's not just me saying it, it's actually, People who study this a lot more than I do who, who say it. So we're going to have some fun, right? We are going to play self-care word match. And the prize is my book. Ooh, I just... Krista, uh, Krista, would you mind while I do this? So this is my book called My Crazy Summer, and I'm just not going to be ashamed now to share about my book. <laughs> so my book is um, most, it's like what are my triggers are. The thing I think that makes this different than some other books, I do have a chapter that a friend wrote, like my best friend that came in, like to share what it was like from her perspective, looking like from, with her viewpoint. I also have a chapter which was an interview with my husband to see what it was like from his perspective. And then at the back, I actually have my journal pages from my crazy summer, just to show you how crazy I was. I probably am sometimes. 
But, um, so yeah, so you get a copy of my book. And if you don't win, I have some here that you can buy. <laughs> and the $20 or 50% of my book sales go to NAMI. So I want to be able to give back because they help me, so I want to help them as well. Thank you. All right. So have you got your, you know what, you all know how to play bingo, right? So it's going to be orange or yellow. As you can see, orange and yellow and blue are my colors, and black and white. Okay, do you want to help me, Laurel? Give Laurel one more round of applause. <laughs> can you pick out, and then hand it to me, and I'll say what it is. Thank you. <laughs> I know, Laurel likes to take control. Yes. <laughs> or do yoga. So cross it out. Shall we go for a line or a full house? Let's see how much time we've got. Is it 11 o'clock? Yes. We're almost there, so we can go for a full house. Okay. Think of something funny. So these are things that when you're feeling stressed and you want to do something else, talk to a friend. Now you may actually feel like that you don't want to talk to anybody, like I did. But it's important to pick up the phone. And there are some people that won't let you be on your own. <laughs> Play on your phone. Some of these, actually, if you look at your word games, some of them look very similar, but there's just maybe one thing that's different. Does everyone know what she means by full house? Not at all. Oh, sorry. <laughs> No, I appreciate that. I remember somebody said to me, we're going bowling. And I was like, oh, lawn bowling. And they're like, no, we're going bowling where you like do skittles. I was like, oh, 10 pin bowling. Okay. You have bowling and 10 pin bowling. Okay. <laughs> do deep breathing. You all know how to do box breathing. That was the first thing that you learned this morning from me. Meet someone new. Now, that might be very challenging if you don't want to talk to anybody. <laughs> Play your favorite sport. And normally when you get your full house in bingo, you say bingo, so you could just say self-care. <laughs> <laughs> um, count to ten. Ask for a hug, if you're a hugger. Learn a new skill. Now that might take some time, and that's okay. Listen to your favorite song. Now I have to share that when I was in my funk, there was just one song that I just played over and over and over and over and over and over again. That really helped me. Play with your pet. Anybody have a pet? Yeah. Aren't pets the best? Mm -hmm. I love my little dog. I said she rescued me and I rescued her. Play a game outside. Or just go outside. Take a nap if you need it. Don't just keep taking naps <laughs> and isolating and being on your own. Take your pet for a walk, even if it's a cat or a fish. I actually read some something recently where I, um, there's a guy in Florida, I think it was, who has a alligator as his emotional support. Read a positive quote. I love quotes. Play a board game. Are we getting close? Have a picnic. You don't realize how long it took me to create this game. I was like, oh, I can't just copy and paste. I've got to like actually think about what goes on each card. Eat a healthy meal. So remember, 90% of your serotonin is in your gut. So what you eat, you are what you eat. 
Um, and just as a, a tidbit of information, um, for women, the maximum amount of added sugar a day that you should be eating is 29 grams. So, and for men, it's 45 grams of added sugar. So, a chai tea latte from Starbucks is actually like 40 grams of sugar. So, I don't drink that anymore. Maybe once a year as a treat for myself. Hi, the lady in red, sorry, you're like, mm, 29 grams, I know. <laughs> Watch your favorite TV show, but not all day. Watch your favorite movie, but not all day. Write a short story. Do a crossword puzzle. I don't do crosswords. Use positive self-talk. Think about how you talk to yourself and ask yourself the question, would you actually talk to your friend the way you talk to yourself? Probably not. Think of your favorite memory. Clean your room. <laughs> That's for me. to calming music. Is anybody just waiting for one? Volunteer your time. Oh my goodness, you did a really good job on this. I did a really good job on <laughs> it. Face your problem. It's like so amazing how, just think about how many problems you've had in the past that you spent a lot of time worrying about that are no longer a problem. And you're like, why did I waste my time on those? But when you're in it, you think, like the end of the world. Go for a walk. Is that also go for a hike or is that? That's a different one. Okay. Just That's a different sure. one. I'm just making sure because <laughs> you said something earlier that was the same thing. I know, I did. I realized that when I said it. Visit somewhere new, even if it's the park down the road that you've never been to. Go for a jog. Do something kind. Be sure to pass it on. Buy somebody, if you're deciding to have your once a year Starbucks, pay for the person behind you. Um, dance. Laurel, actually, I'll show, Laurel goes on dancing walks in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Laugh. Write your own song. You're all gonna say, I got it at once. <laughs> Anybody almost there? Draw a comic. Like that's a cartoon, but yeah. That's the same English and then M M. Yeah. Really think good. of your strengths. Quite often when we're not in a good place, we think of all the bad, but think of the good. Rearrange your room. Set a goal and actually try to work towards it. When it comes to setting goals, quite how many of you are still on track with your New Year's resolution? Their goal, not resolution. Okay. Because a lot of the time, in order to be successful at achieving your goals, it's actually important to take micro steps. Just one small thing at a time will actually get you there. Create an action plan, and obviously do it. Spend time with family. Go for a bike ride. Okay. Are you got it? Yeah. Yay! Yay! Get <laughs> <laughs> too many things to choose from. Okay, there you go. If you want to come up and get your book.
<laughs> it might have been. It might have been better to do it. Well, we're good. We're, we're good. Okay. We're actually almost there, guys. And I'll take some questions. Take a shower. A cold shower. Do you realise that a, go a cold shower is actually really good for you first thing in the morning in terms of increasing your serotonin? Mm -hmm. I don't take a cold shower. Yeah, <laughs> That's what the research yeah. says. Like, oh. I actually have turned my shower like unit like it keeps getting a little bit colder every day. Oh. Exercise. I'm sure you're all super fit. That's an assumption that I have of like five people that they're all super fit nope. and they exercise. That's a bad, assumption. <laughs> yeah. bad assumption. Okay. Uh, hang out with friends. <laughs> Call a relative. Ones that you like. <laughs> Create jewelry. Do we all get the same page? No. Yeah. <laughs> journal. How many of you actually journal? Awesome. Yeah. Journaling is actually doing written, like pen and paper journaling, is actually more effective than doing it on your iPhone or your whatever device you use. Paint or draw. Call a friend. I feel like I had that one before. Oh, we had. Use an I feel message. Do you know what an I feel message is? I no. feel happy. I feel happy. <laughs> I feel yeah. It's actually an I like I feel happy. I feel loved. I feel valued. I feel secure. So I feel. Yeah. I feel hungry. I feel hungry. <laughs> Here's another pet one. Hug your pet. No. We're almost there. Hug your pet. I hug Stu all the time. <laughs> Stu's her pet turtle, by the way. He is a a tortoise, not a turtle. <laughs> okay, smile until you feel better. So this is actually, believe it or not, this is proven scientifically that if you force yourself to smile, you do feel happier eventually. So, um, <laughs> so I know it's like I was told that in the last facility I was in, and I would stand in my bedroom and just be like. Would you rather question? Would you rather be where you are now or would you rather be someplace else? Would you rather be in this place? You know, people say, is your glass half full or half empty? I'm just thankful I have a glass. So, think of the consequences. Elaine, you're almost through the whole bag. Nobody's got a full sheet yet? Almost a full sheet? Has anybody almost got a full sheet? Oh, almost, almost. We have two almost. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Play a card game. Lorel actually has a great card game called Face 10. Face 10. I have Face 10. It's a card game. Go outside. Talk to a counselor. When I lived in Florida, I actually reconnected with my North Carolina counselor. So one of the things that I didn't share with you in my story is that when I, after my first attempt and I thought I was like, okay, I stopped speaking to my psychiatrist and I stopped speaking to my therapist. But now I speak to my therapist and psychiatrist all the time. I'm not gonna stop. Take a hot bath. I prefer showers. Play bingo. Play with your favorite toy. That one's a bit like, what? <laughs> Pick an outfit for tomorrow. So that means that you're thinking about tomorrow. Helps you like think beyond today. Go for a hike. All right, now we're making progress here. Lorel just got back from Jackson in Wyoming and did lots of hiking. Host a dinner party if it's not too stressful for you. Cook or bake? <laughs> Play a video game. We're almost there. Yeah, I'm getting my exercise. <laughs> <laughs> Flip through a magazine. That is actually a question.
question with my, um, as I say, I reconnected with my North Carolina psychologist and I was talking to her on Zoom and she's like, do you have any magazines? I'm like, no. She's like, oh, I was going to ask you to flip through a magazine. I'm like, that's really going to help. She's like, yeah. <laughs> Take a time out, get up, walk. Do a word search. We have two left. We have two left? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody better win. Two left and I got three spots. Oh, I got three spots left. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, I have two spots left. I have two spots left. Let's, let's <laughs> Maybe I need to like right, do this game. <laughs> so I have to tell you that do a word search was um, when I was in, it was called, I can't actually tell you the full name of the place, but it had Villa as its last name and it was in Orlando. And um, one of the things that I really did as a coping mechanism was word searches. And it was like, and my, my therapist would say to me, so what are you going to do when you go home? And you, you don't know what you're going to do. I'm like, I'll do word searches. I haven't done one word search since I've been home. <laughs> Sing. There you go. Yay! Yay! Good job. Think of three things last. you're grateful for. What was the last one? The last so, one three three last things one? that you're grateful for. Oh, yeah. oh, I missed one then. Yeah. Did you say <laughs> oh, oh, there's a bunch that we missed. Oh, okay. Mark them on your sheet then. <laughs> then give it back to me. <laughs>
the reason why it's low and the reason why people think it's high is because of media, people actually saying they've got mental issues when they really don't. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's a really interesting statistic. And so, oh, where's my clicker gone? So as I close up here, here's some resources. So emergency 911, I think you all know that one, right? Um, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Take a picture of this, put it in your phone um, if you're there to help somebody. The Crisis Text Line, which is if you just text 741 741, then you'll get somebody at the other end. The NAMI Helpline, 1 800 950 6264. And then for those of you that live in I think it's the Suffolk Five District, like Lake County, Sumter County, if anybody lives in that area, there's B3 Lake Inc. You see you've got the uh, different organizations there on the left-hand side. NAMI, interesting enough, only deal with people once they have a mental illness. Mental Health America, I love their tagline, hashtag before stage four, because they're about prevention, which I am a huge advocate in trying like to prevent it before it happens. Mental Health First Aid, um, which we talked to, which is by from the National Council for Men Mental Wellbeing. And if you take that training, you actually get a three year nationally recognized certificate qualification. And then you've got for the International Association of Firefighters, did you know about that? Mm -hmm. The wellness organization that's associated. So there's lots of resources out there. And the importance is, it's like having access to the resources before you need them. So it's really important. The next slide is a, this is my call to action to you. If there's just one thing that you take away, well, box breathing, the fact that it's okay to talk about mental health, mental illness, is a call to action. And it's about taking a check up from the neck up. So it's free, it's private, and it's anonymous. So if you go to mhascreening.org, it gives you a list of all the different, different mental conditions, and you can go onto each one of them and just answer the questions and see if it applies to you. So what questions do you have for me? Do you want me to go back to that one? What questions do you have? How did your, I guess, how did your husband, without reading your book, how did he respond? I mean, obviously he responded in the moment by, mm -hmm. but like ongoing supportive care and, you know, the awareness of what's happened in the past. Yeah. How has that change affected, and, and this, I'm going to say, say change affected relationship, but you don't have to answer all of that. That's okay. Generalization or, you know. Yeah, just, no. So we have a knowledge of what a spouse's perspective might be. Sure. Well, you have to get my book. <laughs> um, <laughs> a spouse's perspective. So my husband would say that um, he actually, so we, we actually do rely on our faith a lot. So he said he felt the strongest and most at peace in my first attempt. He actually continued to look after himself. So he would make sure that he was like doing exercise and all that stuff. It's kind of ironic, um, the week before I attempted, we went for a walk because he would make sure that I went out for a walk every day. He would look after me. He was just, he was a rock. He was there. Um, and I know that for some people, and I know, and I know of it, that he, some people just can't deal with it. And so they like, it's a cause of a lot of like breakups. Um, but we've been married for 37 years. And so... The week before, we, we had been on a walk, and the guy in Starbucks, this is before I knew about the 29 grams. <laughs> so the guy in Starbucks asked me, what was I gonna do today? And in my head, I said, I'm gonna kill myself. And I was just like, oh, just hang out. And then I said to my husband, oh, you'll never guess what I just said to the guy in Starbucks. And he's like, I'm not going back to my course. He was actually taking a mental health first aid course for youth and he was supposed to go to his second day and he didn't go. 
And I said, you're stupid, I'm not gonna do that. Like, would I possibly, I, I couldn't possibly do that. No way. Um, so he, he relied on his friends as well for support. I mean, he had his own support system that was important to him. So, and then I, in the second attempt, I thought when I was in the ER, I thought I was actually going to go home. And he said to me, oh, we're not going home. Because I actually was Baker Acted, but the psychiatrist redacted my Baker Act. And he only redacted it on the understanding that I would go and get help. And so my husband had booked me into this facility using the support network. And I was like, drive, I was in the car with him going, I don't want to go. Like, what are you doing? Like, I was totally freaking out. And he's like, oh my goodness, I can understand how people would get divorced. He said, don't worry, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> but he said, I can understand how that would happen because of on the strain on the relationship. So in some respects, it actually made us stronger. And mm -hmm. it's made us come together more because there was a lot of healing through the process. Cool. So yeah, thank you for your question. Yeah. What else? Any other questions? I just want to tell you guys that Elaine, um, I wanted her to see what you kind of go through. So I told her, she had come to a side-by-side. -side oh, I came to side-by-side, -side. yeah. Fire sprinkler demo. And she was just, and if you haven't seen one, you know, the flash over the side. side, by side burn, it's overwhelming yeah. for people that have never seen it to see what, what is, goes on. So, um, and I actually follow now NFSA on LinkedIn and I always like, like their comments because I think it's amazing, you know, the, what happens, like one sprinkler, what a difference it could make, right? Mm -hmm. So if you think about, actually, if you think about one sprinkler, think about one of you and what the difference you can make in somebody's life. Because you all want to save lives, right? And I want to save lives, lives, and that's why I'm here. That's why I'm on a mission. That's why I chose to step out of corporate America and basically lose everything and start from nothing, and that's okay, because I know it's gonna be okay. And it's okay not to be okay. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs>